Good evening, everybody. My name is Laura Miles, and I am the U.S. Sales Leader for Genomine. I want to thank you for joining us tonight to, um, to listen to an introduction to the Genomine Mental Health Map. Um, for those of you, um, hopefully everyone received their Grubhub dinner and the hot foods were hot and the cold foods were cold. You can thank your uh, Genomine Mental Health Map um, sales um, professional team for getting those to you. I hope um, everybody received and, and is enjoying those dinners. Um, I want to tell you briefly a little bit about Genomind. Um, as you can see here, we were founded in 2009 by Dr. Ronald Desorts, uh, who um, did pass of COVID-19. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about uh, Genomind. So we were founded by world-renowned uh, clinicians and scientists who are committed to compassionate care and psychiatric innovation. And we pride ourselves not only on our scientific rigor and transparency, but also in destigmatizing mental health issues in conjunction with educating our, our clients, our customers on genetics. Um, you can see here some statistics on our progress. Uh, tonight, your featured speaker is Dr. Daniel Van Dorn. He is a PharmD and comes to us uh, via Temple University. He is also um, a lead scientist and our senior medical MSL. And Dr. Van Dorn was very instrumental in the development of the Mental Health Map product and really is our foremost uh, subject matter expert in all things Mental Health Map and in the, um, in the wellness space here at Genomine. Um, he has served in a variety of healthcare settings, including the armed forces and in the clinical setting. And as you can see, has published extensively on pharmacogenomics and develop, develop, ah, I cannot speak, developmental uh, genetics. Um, his wingman tonight is uh, Dr. Harris Wynn, who is also a PharmD and one of our uh, also strong medical science liaisons. Uh, Dr. Wynn comes to us from Temple University, where he researched outcomes in hepatitis C and HIV. And we were lucky to have uh, Dr. Wynn uh, participate in an internship with us where we lured him um, and he chose to stay. So we're really delighted to have him tonight. He's going to be um, answering all your chat questions, um, which um, I hope you all will feel free to um, enter. There's a couple of logistics questions before we get started. On the bottom, you can see there's some icons. And there is a chat box there where you can certainly feel free to enter in any questions along the way so that we can keep uh, Dr. Van Dorn on task. Uh, tomorrow, you'll be receiving a copy of the presentation and a link to the recording so that you can listen to this again at your leisure or share with your colleagues. You have all been muted to minimize any background noise. Sorry if you are hearing my beagle barking here. <laughs> um, and then time permitting, we will also be having a live Q&A uh, chat at the very end. If you have any technical issues, feel free to let us know that in the chat and we'll try and get those um, resolved. So with that, I will turn uh, it over to Dr. Van Doren to walk us through the agenda and the presentation. Thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, so a, a very, this is, uh, the agenda is very short uh, because I, I like to keep things simple. When we first started doing these presentations, I, I realized we were trying to fit way too much in one presentation. So now we're actually breaking these up. Uh, tonight, you can think of this as really an introduction to the mental health map. Uh, I'm gonna start with really an introduction to how we perceive personalized mental health care, how we can see how genetics can play a role, both the value as well as the limitations, because I think it's important to, to explore both of those and have an understanding in what genetics can and cannot do uh, in, in clinical practice. I'm then going to uh, basically give you a review, an introduction, I should say, to the mental health map. Another thing you're going to receive tomorrow uh, after the, the presentation, along with the recordings and a copy of these slides, is I'm going to give you access um, to the interactive report itself so that you can continue to explore on your own. There is a lot of information in the panel, um, in the report, there's no way that we could really do a deep dive tonight. But as I said, we, we are splitting this up. So think of this as tonight's presentation as really a primer uh, to, to give you an introduction to what the mental health map is. And you will also receive a um, uh, invitation within the next two or three weeks 
uh, to a discussion next month, but we'll actually have a special guest, Dr. Uh, Keith Alone, uh, a good friend of mine, um, who was actually very instrumental in us actually having this presentation tonight, and I'll explain more on that later. He's a founder and CEO of uh, Arroyos Treatment Centers and uh, the Arroyos Psychological Associates in uh, Pasadena, California. Um, he leads a, a multifunctional team of therapists and prescribers uh, focused primarily on, on diathesis stress, or I should say stress diathesis disorders. Um, and as I said, he was one of the early adopters is how I, I actually got to know him and, and was actually um, sort of gave us a perspective shift in what mental health map could actually mean for clinicians as well. And uh, Laura, just so you know, I'm, I don't know if you see it, but I'm seeing some people in the waiting room. I just let them in, but I don't know if you can see that. If not, we might need to um, address that. So I'm gonna start a discussion talking about what we call Mental Health 360. So this is uh, basically a model uh, for how Genomine approaches uh, a personalized approach for, for mental health. And it really just starts very simply. It's a very simple model. We all know that mental health is a function of environment, lifestyle, and experiences. So for example, we know that socio socioeconomic status, apparently I've lost my ability to speak English tonight, uh, and family home life are really important for human behavior and, and uh, cognitive development. We know that um, physical fitness, uh, social life, especially social life, I think uh, has been emphasized by recent world events is very important, as well as other experiences. So trauma, uh, abuse, uh, other issues like that. Um, and yet we also know that there's another component. There's an inherent uh, sort of constitutional factor as well. Um, I, I had the opportunity when I was a younger man, I served in the Navy uh, and I had the opportunity to serve in humanitarian missions, um, uh, I also, as a civilian, I, I served in medical missions in developing countries, including um, Haiti, and it always fascinated me. I think this is really where my, my career in, in behavioral genetics took off. It fascinated me that, that two individuals, brothers even, who were raised in the same environment, lived the same lifestyle, had the same similar experience, the same uh, exposed to the same trauma, would have very different responses to that event. Um, one would be able to go past that or even thrive, then another would, would continue to struggle. And that speaks to some inherent quality that I've, I think we understand. We've, you know, even before we cracked the human genome oh, almost two decades ago, we knew that family history played a large role in the risk of developing similar um, disorders in the future. But only recently have we really exponentially um, developed an understanding of the specific uh, you know, uh, genetics and, and the variants that really impact this and the specific pro, uh, proteins and receptors and enzymes that play a role in this. And that's really what we're focused on tonight. Um, however, I, I, I wanted, I, the reason why I, I wanted to start with this model, because I think this very simply and elegantly shows both the value and the promise of genetic testing in mental health, but also the limitations as well. And to illustrate that, I'm actually gonna give you a personal example. I'm gonna actually disclose to you my genetics that I learned through taking my mental health map. And it's uh, this specific variant, by variant, I mean a change in the genetic code, which I'll touch on, in this gene called CACNA1C. Now that gene name doesn't mean much to you, but it's, it encodes, it provides the blueprint to make the voltage gated calcium channel. And I'll explain a little bit more on that in a bit. Now there's many things, there's many different ways that you can analyze DNA. What our company does is we look at the small changes in the genetic code. Um, so for example, in this gene, most of you listening to this program tonight, um, the majority of humans on earth actually at this specific site that we test have a G allele, guanine. Or you may have you know, a, an A allele there, one copy of an A, an adenine. And what I mean by that is everyone has two copies of each gene. We have one copy from our mom, one copy from our dad. Now, most of us have two G alleles. Some of us have one A allele because we inherited that adenine from one of our parents. I, however, inherited an A allele from both of my parents. And in genome-wide association studies, so these are studies, hundreds of thousands of individuals where they look at those with a disorder and those without and look at what's different in their genetics. They, we've learned that just being born with my genotype is uh, increases my risk of being diagnosed with uh, bipolar disorder one, 
and schizophrenia by about 15 to 20%. Wow, okay. So I, I see some of you have your screen on. Um, so I guess I should be taking lithium or an antipsychotic. Would you agree with that? No. No, okay. Of course not, right? That, I'm, I'm not distributing symptoms of schizophrenia or bipolar. I'm pretty sure the voice I just heard was real. Um, so why is this useful? To me? Why is this information useful to me to know that I have this genotype? Well, it actually has to do with the, the underlying biology and looking at how that might impact overall behaviors, not diagnosing uh, a mental health disorder. Genetics cannot diagnose people. Uh, there is no such thing as a schizophrenia gene or a bipolar gene. Um, genes don't encode diseases, they encode proteins and receptors and enzymes. In this case, this encodes for the voltage-gated calcium channel. And this is a channel that lives here on the axon terminal. Now we've all, I think, been exposed or learned a little bit about neurobiology. We know that a neuron propagates a, a signal using a depolarization that travels down the axon. That signal hits this voltage-gated calcium channel, which allows calcium to flood into the cell. And that triggers the release of the next neurotransmitter. It causes degranulation. My genotype, this A allele, my specific genotype, is associated with increased expression of these channels. What does that mean for me? Well, basically, I, it means I make more, I'm likely to make more of these channels. So it's almost like having a hair trigger, trigger, again, I've lost my ability to speak, a hair trigger for these neurons to fire. And why is it important? Why were we interested in this gene and then learning more? Well, because the whole point of that genome-wide association study where we linked it to bipolar, it's not that we're interested in this gene to diagnose bipolar, but the fact that it's so highly you know, significant as a risk factor means that this might likely plays a role in the ideology of developing that disorder. And when we start to hone in on specific behaviors, not just those with a disorder, but healthy volunteers, we see that this is associated with increased tendency towards certain behaviors that we all display to a certain extent. And we all fall somewhere on a spectrum from adaptive to maladaptive. Those with my genotype with excessive excitatory signaling, it's associated with mood liability and neuroticism. It's associated with sleep latency, trouble falling asleep, a heightened startle response. And if you think about this, mood liability, neuroticism, sleep latency, trouble falling asleep because the neurons keep on going, a heightened startle response because you have a hair trigger for the neuron to fire, this is all starting to, to co you know, congeal into a, a narrative here as to why this might be involved. And so the value isn't to say, oh, you're at increased risk of bipolar, but rather, hey, if you're struggling, struggling with any of these behaviors, maybe this plays a role in that. And so what I'm going to call out here is, again, that gene, you know, you wouldn't diagnose someone with bipolar because they have a spe specific gene. Similar to how you would not diagnose someone for PTSD just because they were exposed to trauma or that they were raised in a poor home life. But when you combine all these factors together, their genetic predispositions based on the neurobiology, the underlying root cause, plus their actual behavior and these other experiences, then we truly, we've, we've gained great insight into how this provides resolution and how to target and personalize a treatment approach to these patients. And our entire platform at Genomine is designed not just to provide the genetic information, but actually provide education and resources and further information so you can plug that into these other factors because that's really where it, it makes a difference. And we have two uh, primary genetic tests that two you know, major things in our arsenal that allows us to do this. The first is the Genomine mental health map, which is what we're discussing tonight. And another is the Genomine professional PGX express test. So if this is a test that you're interested in, I, I realize that we have a few prescribers on tonight. And if you're not familiar with this, this is a genetic test that looks at genes uh, that modulate a response to medication, both the uh, pharmacodynamic genes, so dopamine receptor, uh, serotonin transporter, as well as the pharmacokinetic genes, so how we metabolize um, different drugs, so phase one and phase two enzymes. If that's something you're interested, please notify uh, Dr. Nguyen and he'll follow up with you and provide more information on that. Tonight, we're actually focused on the Genomine mental health map, which does not need to be ordered by a prescribing clinician and actually does not need to be in interpreted by prescribing clinicians. It's actually a direct consumer test uh, designed to really lower the threshold to uh, take ownership of one's own behavior. So some of you might be wondering, 
why then am I, have I received this invitation to uh, learn about this test, which seems to be direct to consumer, but this whole event seems to be targeted towards clinicians? Well, it actually goes back to Dr. Keith Vallone, um, who you, you'll have a chance to meet next month, as well as other clinicians who came to us after we launched this test. We had actually no intention to actually target this for clinical utility. This was really designed for consumers. But when these consumers who happened to be patients brought it to their psychologists, to their psychiatrists, and started actually having these discussions, they, they found that it really augmented, it enhanced um, their, their treatment approach. And I, I hope to, to give you some ideas of how that might, might apply to your case. But first, I just want to give you some basics. Again, this, this whole night is really just an introduction to the mental health map. And then we're going to give you lots of tools, lots of goodies, so that you continue, continue to explore on your own, as well as contact us for, for more information. So just the process, what this is, right? how you collect the sample, is it's a chimp, simple cheek swab. So you don't have to draw blood. Uh, it's very non-invasive. Uh, uh, the, the client can receive this in their home. You can basically, they can have this sent to their, direct to their, their home address, or you can uh, order these to have these in your clinic and you can swab them there. Uh, you send it in and within uh, three to five days after we receive it here at the lab, uh, they receive their interactive report. And, and actually I should say reports plural uh, because the mental health map itself is not a report. It actually is comprised of seven different genetic reports. Uh, the stress and anxiety report, the mood report, focus and memory, these what we call capabilities. These reports represent core clusters of behaviors or traits or symptoms that are distinct but they overlap, they influence each other. And the whole term mental health map comes from the idea of, of looking at the inherited variants, the variations, these changes in the genetic code that some of us received from our ancestors, but others didn't, that impact the connections between these domains. I gave you the example of my inherited variant, which had an impact on cognition, sleep, mood, and stress and anxiety. And when you can combine the narrative that shows how these things are connected, what we find is the- Hi. Oh. Hi guys, really? I wanna ask you to-, to, to I, I really welcome questions if you wanna pipe up, but if you, if you don't have a question, if you could mute yourself, uh, I think that would be helpful for everyone else. I think I was getting towards, and uh, Laura, can you, can you help with the muting? Ryan, yep. Yep, thank you. Um, <laughs> so I think I was, what I was getting at is the, these different capabilities, these different reports. It's really looking at how these different clusters of behaviors are all important for mental health and how they are combined. And hopefully we'll be able to give you a, a, a better example of that tonight. To explore one of these uh, capabilities further, is these reports further, we can talk about the organization because there is a lot of information in the mental health map. <clears throat> and so we organize each report by traits. And you can think of these traits as additional subclusters of behaviors or symptoms that again are distinct, but they overlap, they influence each other. <clears throat> when it comes to stress and anxiety, the three traits we're looking at is stress response, which is our visceral immediate response to stress, adaptability, which is how we're predisposed to adapt to certain situations, and then anxiety, which is how, well, stress is expressed in our behavior over time, usually as a function of the other two. We've curated a panel looking at basically the, all the literature um, basically performed to date, all the studies performed to date, all the top uh, genetic variants that seem to impact uh, proteins, receptors, or enzymes that impact predisposed individuals to certain behaviors within these traits. So heightened fear response or stress response, startle, um, dopamine signaling. So the basically increased or uh, uh, decreased uh, dopamine tone impacts our ability to thrive in chaos versus uh, thriving in structure, it seems. Uh, worry, nervousness, tension, the, the list goes on. But I want to point out that, you know, for example, if you're treating a patient for anxiety, similar to there's not a lot of value in telling someone that they're, they have an increased risk of schizophrenia, um, telling someone that they have an increased, you know, they are predisposed to a heightened stress response. Well, if they're already struggling with anxiety, this is, some, this is not news to them. But we actually find that there is value here because it provides validation. It starts with validation. Oh, it's not just me, it's based on my biology. And actually to, to explore the biology further, that's where we focus on the mechanism, what we call the biological mechanism. In this case, the mechanism is stress hormone regulation. And the genes are CRHR1 and FKBP5. Now, again, these gene names don't mean much to you, 
you can think of this as the on switch uh, proteins or receptors that act as the on switch or the off switch for the fight or flight response. This individual we're calling out as being predisposed to a heightened stress response because of their genotype in the FKBP5 gene, which is the off switch. And to explore this further, exactly how this works, FKBP5 is actually a binding protein that its only job actually is to bind glucocorticoid receptor. And glucocorticoid receptor is an example of a nuclear receptor, um, and, and meaning that it has to get into the nucleus to do its job and turn on certain genes and turn off others. But FKBP5, it prevents glucocorticoid receptor from doing that. What glucocorticoid, uh, the brand, I've lost my ability to speak, what glucocorticoid receptor does in the brain is it's actually involved in the negative regulation of the fight or flight response, the sympathetic response. It's actually involved in the parasympathetic response, turning off that fight or flight response when they're no longer running away from the tiger, lion, or bear. Um, and how this works is when we are exposed to a threat and we have elevated levels of cortisol in our system, including our brain, that increased, that spike in cortisol actually kicks FKBB5 off of glucocorticoid receptor, which allows it to go into the nucleus, turn things on when it actually turns off the fight or flight response, which then lowers cortisol. And so this is a really elegant sort of uh, allosteric curve. You get just the, the right amount of, of stress hormones when you need it, and then when you no longer need it, you can turn that down. It allows us to turn off the fight or flight response. It's sort of, sort of like the thermostat, if you will. But this individual's genotype is TT. Most of us have a C allele here, either CC or CT. This individual is a homozygote for the T allele. And this is associated, similar to my genotype with the voltage-gated calcium channel, with increased expression of FKBP5. And what happens here is with increased levels of FKBB5, it requires higher and higher levels of cortisol to kick it off. It's basic uh, competitive inhibition. Uh, with more FKBB5, you can think of two gangs that are fighting. FKBB5 has more, more, you know, a bigger posse, so it takes high, more cortisol to fight it off of glucocorticoid receptor. And we can see the effects of this in real time. In fact, what we mean by a heightened stress response is the actual physiological response to stress. And this is actually studied in healthy volunteers, usually uh, college age kids in something called the Trier Social Stress Test. Uh, I guess college age kids because they're willing to do anything for a free lunch. This is where they take these individuals and they'll put them in some, some type of stressful situation. The most common one that they do is uh, uh, social stress, which is they put them in front of an audience and tell them to do a speech or something. And then they measure their salivary cortisol. And those with the, this individual's genotype, the increased FKBB5 genotype, their cortisol levels go through the roof compared to those with more common genotype. So where we're getting with this is now we start with validation. If this is something that the patient is struggling with, maybe now we have an understanding as to one of the things that's driving that ideology, why they may have that increased sensitivity to stress. For our ancestors, this would be a great thing. This likely helped them survive because they were facing lions and tigers and bears on a weekly, if not daily basis in some cases. Us modern humans, of course, we're no longer faced with those threats. And of course, you can continue to explore what that might mean for the patient on your own. The main thing is, is by understanding the biology, it provides a few things. It's validation. Oh, it's not just in my head. It's not just that I'm weak or broken. This is based on something I inherited from our ancestors. This is how I might be wired. And once we learn that, it gives us a plan for improvement. There are things we can do to target this pathway. Now, of course, the genetics is just one component. We actually want to assess actual behavior. So within the mental health map, as you will see on your own, as you, as you continue to explore, we provide access to screeners, the GAD7, the PHQ9, the pediatric symptom checklist. So they can continue to explore these on their own. And what we find is that this gives them the, the empowerment uh, the, the vocabulary to explore their own feelings and actually accelerates and, and enhances the discussion that they have with you, their provider. Now, as I said, there is a lot of information. You'll see this firsthand when you go through the report. And it's easy to imagine how uh, clients or patients can get overwhelmed when perhaps even misinterpret this. So as I said, Genomind, it's not just, we're, we don't just sell genetic tests. What we, what we really offer, what all of us at Genomind truly believe in is taking this to the next level and, and bringing a personalized approach to mental health because we see the power it can have. 
So each mental health map comes with a free consultation with what we call the Genomind advisor. So this is not a therapist, it's not a psychiatrist. This is someone who's either a geneticist um, or someone who is a health coach and has been trained in the interpretation. Their whole job is just to walk them through how to navigate the report. And I'm gonna give you a sample of that tonight, actually, um, because really, like I said, this is gonna be an introduction. I'm actually gonna give you an idea of what uh, a typical uh, consumer would receive when they have their first consult with myself or Dr. Nguyen or one of our health coaches. Uh, so I'm actually, this is gonna be a choose your own adventure type of thing. Uh, I think Laura is gonna put a, um, uh, a poll on the screen and you get to tell me where you want to start our navigation, where you want to start our exploration. The mental health map, as I said, there's seven uh, different capabilities we could explore. You tell me where you wanna start it. Oh, looks like stress and anxiety is in the lead. Oh, it's live? Yep. This is where someone needs to be singing the Jeopardy song. Yeah. A Jeopardy song and, and sort of a, a waiting song as we're waiting for people to join us at the beginning. Do, 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 do. You know. Um... We got a pretty hefty lead for stress and anxiety. 23 out of 38 have voted. Do we I want to call that's this? your runaway winner right yeah, there? Yeah, I think, I think we're going to call that. So I'm going to end polling. I'm going to share results so you can all see it. So I'm, so stress and anxiety. So basically, we, I'm, what, uh, everyone can see my screen right now. Am I sharing the right screen, Laura? Yes. OK, perfect. So this is the actual interactive report. And you're, like I said, you're gonna have access to this report um, tomorrow. We're actually gonna give you access to this so you can con continue, blah, I've lost my ability to speak. You can continue to explore this on your own. And it starts here, basically a welcoming page for the mental health map. And that's where you can schedule a consult. Uh, and then you can also, and this may be of interest to you, some of you genetics gurus out there, you, you can have access to our report references. This is essentially our white paper. Uh, basically everything that we claim on the mental health map is based on published literature and we're very transparent on that. So you can actually explore this on your own, including uh, links to PubMed itself so you can, you can access the studies uh, directly. Um, when we go to the report itself, you know, we can access the stress and anxiety report. And I'm gonna show you how each report is, is layered. Um, so that people are not overwhelmed all at once. And at the beginning, right, uh, we start with stre stress and anxiety. We explore how the reports are organized as I, I think I covered this before, how we look at three traits, stress response, adaptability, and anxiety. And we call it the first trait is stress response. And I always find it's important when I'm talking to clients, uh, whether they're patients or people who are just interested in wellness, improving their general uh, resilience, to start here because this really is at the crux of understanding the physiology of, of anxiety, right? This is a natural process. Anxiety is actually an adaptive process that allowed our ancestors to survive. And of course, it's, it's somewhat reductionist going back to that, that triune brain that, you know, talking about the reptile brain versus human brain. And of course, there's some debate regarding the accuracy of that, but it's, it's, a, it's a narrative that seems to resonate with, with patients, with clients. It, it makes sense because it's really um, validates that this is something that is, is, can be good in some contexts, right? That a heightened stress response in and of itself is not necessarily a bad thing. It really depends on what we do with that. And that leads us towards things that we can do to control that. Um, grounding exercises, CBT, etc. We also provide uh, direct links to videos uh, because you know, people have different learning styles. So those who are more audiovisual will have access to basically Someone on my team um, basically describing everything that you could either read or just listen to us and do it for you. As we scroll down, you'll see actually in this case, this that same gene I covered before, FKB5, this individual is a heterozygote, but that's what we call normal activity. Normal activity, all that means is it doesn't you know, mean that the alternative is abnormal. It just means that we looked at these two genes and this individual's genotype is not associated with any type of physio known uh, or clearly elucidated physiological impact. And so normal activity, it doesn't mean that stress and anxiety is not a concern. It just means if it is, 
this isn't the likely culprit. This isn't necessarily the thing to focus on. But we do call out a heightened stress response for a different mechanism. In this case, it's BDNF. And I think some of you, many of you are probably familiar with BDNF, but I, I like to showcase this because I want you to see how we explore this mechanism with your patients. And just to, to, to basically uh, really briefly talk on, to, to touch on this, um, BDNF stands for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. This is like a brain cell growth protein. Uh, when we're first born, when we're neonates, we have billions of neurons, but they're not doing anything. Uh, they're not connected. Well, that's why when we're first born, we have about a thousandfold increase in BDNF levels in our brain than we do as adults, because it's stimulating these neurons to form these connections with each other, uh, the, the reach out and contact each other and form these networks. Around the age of six, um, BDNF has done its job almost too well, and we actually have lots of these connections that aren't doing anything, which is why any of you have children can attest to this. Around the age of six, we're all a little psychotic. We're not very rational beings. But it's also where we do our best learning because that's where BDNF flips the switch and begins, uh, oh, I clicked the wrong button. It flips the switch and actually starts pruning those connections we no longer need, we no longer need, and it reinforces those connections we do need. So it's basically the central neuroplasticity engineer. It's the, the main guy, if you will. Well, this individual's genotype is, is valmet. So this is valine versus methionine. And in genetics, whenever you have a valine to a methionine shift, that's a bulky amino acid to a shrimpy one, that's causing decreased activity of the protein. And that's what's, what this is associated with. And similar to how I described before, the trier social stress test, consistently, this has been replicated time and time again, uh, individuals with this genotype tend to have higher cortisol levels when exposed to stress. So let's talk about what we can do about that. So we do provide what's called genotype-based recommendations. So a genotype-based recommendation means, hey, what we're about to talk about for you may be particularly important. And in this case, BDNF represents this very important link between the brain and the body. When our ancestors were exerting themselves physically, they were likely doing something important for their survival. So we evolved this mechanism by which whenever we exert ourselves physically, we boost BDNF directly in the brain. So this individual's genotype is associated with decreased BDNF activity, exercise increases BDNF activity in expression. So this is a natural way to target this underlying mechanism, but we can go further. We can have, show you direct outcome data that shows that this works. So we, we walk through this study and we provide again, videos that walk through this as well. Uh, this was a study of over a thousand, about th a little over a thousand veterans, uh, soldiers, I should say, uh, who were exposed to battle trauma. Uh, and not surprisingly, those with this genotype, this increased stress sensitivity genotype, they had increased rates of PTSD and more severe symptoms. When they stratified those soldiers by their physical activity level, those who had the increased rate of physical activity did not have the increased risk. So we have actual outcome data that shows that if you follow this genotype-based recommendation, it can improve outcomes. But also remember what I said before about the interconnectivity of these domains. And we all know, I think, that there's a really important link between stress and anxiety and cognition. And I think BDNF also represents a very important link here as well. So if we go over to the focus and memory report and we explore this, and we can actually see that this same genotype in BDNF has also been linked to decreased working memory scores. Uh, basically, they test this by giving you a series of numbers and telling you to repeat it back. Now, unlike heightened stress response, which could be an upside uh, if, if you're one of our ancestors or if you're an EMT or a soldier, uh, that could be adaptive in some situations. There does not seem to be an upside to decreased working memory. But here's the thing, when it comes to mental health genetics, it's not like some of us have bad genes and others have good genes. Rather, we inherited from our ancestors genetic variants that provide some type of benefit in, an, in one environment, but cause us to struggle in others. And I wanna really double down on exercise here. Again, exercise seems so pedantic, right? Everyone knows exercise is good for them. But for these individuals, this is where you really wanna double down on this and hone in on the importance of physical activity because there really is direct outcome data that shows that this works particularly well in those with this genotype. So this was a study of over a thousand volunteers, not soldiers necessarily, who gave a genetic sample and they took a test of working memory. And on average, us modern sedentary humans compared to our ancestors who have this genotype, they tend to have decreased scores of working memory. But when you look at these individuals as they increase their physical activity level, 
not only do they compensate for that impaired working memory, they actually end up exceeding the scores of those with a more common genotype. And if you think about this, for our ancestors, they likely were not as sedentary as we are today. So for them, this genotype likely gave them an edge. This was adaptive. It's only based on our, our modern lifestyle that this can actually be deleterious. And I think that right there, if we had to end right, to, right now and go to Q&A, I think that provides some insight into the value of mental health map. It's not telling you really necessarily what's wrong with you or it's not diagnostic, but it provides some insight into the personalized actions that one can do to, to go further. I should actually though, just touch on a few other things. So in addition to the genotype-based recommendations, I'll actually go back to stress and anxiety. In, additional, in addition to the genotype-based recommendations, <clears throat> we also provide insight into um, basic you know, evidence-based approaches to address stress and anxiety or cognition or eating behavior, things that they can do to sort of take control uh, or sort of bring, get, get internal locus of control that this is something that they can sort of improve uh, with your help, of course. So we give them an introduction to mindfulness and meditation practices because we know that this improves um, outcomes in the trier social stress test. In that same study where they, people have higher cortisol, when they practice meditation, they actually show a significant decrease in that cortisol response. So it's, it's not necessarily addressing BDNF itself, but it's definitely addressing the behavior. The same goes for box breathing or breathing exercises or other grounding exercises, and you'll find those throughout the report. Uh, you'll see that we also, in this case, not as applicable if you use this for your patients, but remember this is a direct consumer. So some individuals, they might not be seeing a clinician at this time. We provide insight into how to approach getting help if this is a specific concern. We provide access to uh, the uh, GAD7 through Mental Health America, which is a leading um, mental health advocacy group. Um, and what we find is for those who have a hard time expressing their behavior or have a hard time coming to terms with their struggle, this is sometimes the key. And we actually, there's, out, there's data that shows this, that just giving them access to this tool gives them, empowers them, gives them the vocabulary to actually have that important discussion with you, their provider. And then of course, if they don't have a provider, if you are a, a Genomind user, they would gain access to a list of our Genomind users in their area so they can reach out for help. Um, Laura, I could keep on talking, but I wanna be mindful of time. I really wanna keep this under an hour. I was trying to keep it under 45 minutes, but unfortunately I think I, I, uh, I tend to be long-winded. Is there anything I missed? I don't think so. Okay, so let's, let's clear up with some logistic stuff and then leave time for, for q and I'm happy to continue exploring this, but I think, you know, next steps is important and really how to, to go from here. Perfect. So I wanted to touch on a couple of the logistics um, questions. I know uh, Dr. Van Doren covered this uh, at a super high level at the beginning. Um, so the MSRP uh, or the full, you know, retail price of the general Genomine Mental Health Map is five ninety nine. If you are a consumer and you were to go on Amazon uh, or our website, you would be paying five ninety nine. We have uh, developed a professional discount program which provides for you. Um, clinicians a priority discount of 25% off, which is equivalent to $150 off, which uh, brings that down to about $450. Uh, this is uniquely available to you through Genomine, and it is the lowest discounted price you will ever, ever find um, this offering at. So I know we do some promotions on Amazon for you know uh, Black Friday or Mother's Day, uh, but it'll always be the lowest through this professional discount program. Um, we do issue a discount code for your use, and you would simply use that to order through um, Genomine's mentalhealthmap.com website. You can order those kits and have those sent directly to your office or sent to your patient's door. Uh, the choice is yours. Uh, super simple to, um, to actually do the test. You just swab through the um, cheek swab, you ship the kit to us, we provide a prepaid um, mailer, and then in three to five business days, you'll receive the results um, by email and it'll walk you to the website where you will go through and look through all the different reports. So super easy to order and to do the actual process. 
Um, Dr. Van Doren also mentioned that we've got this webinar on May 27th, where Dr. Valone is going to be walking us through a case use discussion. And we would love for you all to join us in that endeavor. And then also Dr. Van Doren offers his um, office hours, um, which you can have either one-on-one -on -one with him or a bi-weekly forum discussion in a group uh, every other Friday. So we would love to have you join us for those um, as your schedule permits. And then last but not least, um, this is the login so that you can go in and, um, you know, walk through an actual uh, sort of dummy sample report and website and go through each of the seven different reports. So you're going to receive a copy of this presentation tomorrow through email. So don't feel like you need to take a screenshot of this right now. You'll have this in the presentation that you'll receive. But this is a fantastic opportunity for you to go in as if you were a patient and really have the ability to go through the interactive reports and see all the links and the videos and really experience firsthand, um, you know, what it's like to receive uh, the Genomine Mental Health Map. All right. So with that, um, I I'd really, I'd, I'm opening up to questions. If anyone has any, uh, wants to go back and do a deep dive on the report, uh, focus on a different capability, or if you have logistic questions, please speak. So you can enter uh, your question or comment in the chat box on the bottom icon, or you can simply unmute yourself by hovering over your little um, Brady Bunch box and clicking on the unmute button and feel free to, uh, to pose a question or comment. I know there's a couple of clinicians on here that have actually used our test. I would love to hear your feedback if you feel like sharing some of your insights and experiences on how you've used the test with your clients and patients. We won't call them out though. We don't wanna put them on the spot if they don't feel like No, that. but I do see a question here. Do we provide the raw data file with the report? Yep, yeah, so the, the raw data file in this case, so I can actually show you what this looks like. So raw data, most when people ask for raw data, they're generally referring to uh, micro array data, which is hundreds of thousands of SNPs, which uh, basically if you order 23andMe or Ancestry, that's the raw data. They'll give you a, a, a DAT file, which is just all the raw data. Um, we do not use that technology because that's not CLIA, uh, a CAP uh, compliant for all, most of that data. In fact, we there's there's been reports, uh, actually published research showing that when you look at microarray for those variants that 23andMe does not report, so the raw data that you might use for one of these third party, um, almost half of that data is, is erroneous. It's not consistent. If we, and we've done this, if you send someone's sample in 10 times to 23andMe and look at the raw data, not what they report, like April and some of those others, they'll get 10 different results. We actually have a curated panel where we only, we've actually curated 38 specific variants across 35 genes. And that's all we test because we've gone through a rigorous process to ensure that every time we give you a result, it's 99.9% .9 accurate, uh, which is basically what would be required for a clinical decision-making, even though probably as a direct-to-consumer, that wouldn't be completely necessary because of our heritage in the mental health realm, we thought it important to maintain that. But I can show you what the raw data would look like. And this can be useful when you have a patient, if you actually do use this for a patient, uh, we give the raw results in the form of basically a PDF, which let me blow this up because you probably can't see it, where we provide the gene, the genotype, a quick sort of rundown of the predisposition. And again, it's not all the interactive material, but it's a way that if you had five minutes before the patient walked in, you could make little notes on this and prepare for that, that meeting. Let me know if that did not answer the question. Um, I also want to just comment, because uh, I know we've received this question in the past, mm -hmm. so we do not provide any interpretation assistance or guidance uh, on any other uh, genetic tests. So if you've done 23andMe and you've got their data and you want to send it to us for interpretation, we do not provide that service. Um, yeah, we, we, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, again, the, the 23andMe, right, so the, the, they've, for the, the, the results that they report on their health, genetic health risk assessment, 
that is certified. They validated those specific variants. It's all the other hundreds of thousands of SNPs that they have not validated. And 23andMe themselves or Ancestry will say on the report, use caution when interpreting the raw data because we have no idea if this is correct. And so if you do use that data, just do so with caution and understand that it might not be um, to the level for, for clinical utility. There was another question on here. How do you vet providers who you recommend through the find a provider option for clients? Are all clinicians on there people who have been trained on the Genomine program or just local clinicians? So it's actually a mix. So I think for the most part, so we just launched the mental health map. The pharmacogenetic test is the mainstay. So these are clinicians who have ordered genetic tests, have done a consult with us, who are, understand how to use it. So training to a certain degree, um, we don't have a specific certification plan yet, although we do provide access to free CMEs for interpreting pharmacogenetic data. I am developing now a sort of official uh, training program and certification program for M mental health map. Now that would not be uh, CE or CME qualified because it would be branded, but it would give you basically the, I would go through the entire report for you, with you and show you how to use the mental health map. In fact, Keith Fallone, uh, this is how we became friends and so I, he's volunteered his time to do these discussions with us. We are actually not paying him to do these dinner programs for us. Um, he, we became friends and, and through this sort of, I, I sort of a, uh, ad hoc training program where I was meeting with him once a week, where we were going through different patient reports and, and exploring these mechanisms. Um, does the patient's data change over the different times of their life? No, not in this case. So what we, what we test, the inherited genetic variants, that does not change. Um, so the, 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 there are, so it's not like the highly, um, well, I'm, I could answer that in a very technical way. So the, the, the very short answer is no, they don't change. Is there a place that mentions medications? And if so, do you combine it, genetic data to assist with medication choices? So we do, not with a mental health map, but that's actually the pharmacogenetic test, the Genomine Professional PGX. And uh, so that was uh, Dr. Dreikert. We, we can reach out to you if you wanna learn more about the PGX test. So that is actually the one that would need to be ordered by the prescribing clinician. For mental health map, we don't mention medications because it's direct to consumer and we don't want patients, it, it, God forbid, they, they misinterpret it and stop taking their medication because of misinterpreting that information. We will mention in some cases things like um, magnesium, um, folic acid, vitamin B12, uh, but we do so cautiously that we do not want this to become one of those genetic tests that tells you which supplements you should be on. I know that those tests exist. Uh, usually they, they, they take certain liberties, um, but in certain cases, for example, MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, individuals with that variant, we will mention folate and methylfolate. We will mention magnesium as a natural calcium channel blocker, for example, for my genetic variant associated with excessive calcium influx. If I have trouble falling asleep, magnesium is a natural calcium channel blocker and has been shown to improve sleep duration and quality. So we'll have a discussion on that, but not, not medications, no. Uh, does insurance cover testing? So mental health map, no, uh, because this would be considered direct to consumer uh, tests. So that, that it's, not, it's not designed for clinical decision-making. The pharmacogenetic test, the other test that we did not cover tonight, that would be covered by some insurances. And that's something, again, we could follow up on. Uh, did I miss any? So does, and if there are a place that mentions medication, sorry, I'm reading through. I didn't um, see any other ones, Dr. Van Dorn. Okay, uh, also I want to add that we don't include, oh, that was Laura answering. So actually Carol's saying, I missed a couple questions above. Do you provide the raw data? Uh, how do you vet the providers? Oh, the 30 minute consult that is available with a test, is this for clinician and patient? So yeah, it can be, so that if the patient in this case would be the consumer, because this is this would be their, their test, and they would schedule the consult. They, we have set up a system by which if they want to have that consult with you on the line, we make that very easy. And we can follow up with your, your actual, uh, we'll put you, who, you, who contacted you to visit to, to come to this dinner tonight. They can provide you more information on that process. Uh, but basically, they'll find a time that works for both you and the patient. 
Um, the, the patient will schedule the time, put in the note section that they want you on the call. And then myself or Dr. Nguyen would set up a Zoom conference call to make that easy for everyone. Um, that might be actually, yeah, we found that that's pretty good. That's good to do for maybe the first one or two tests. But after a while, you'll see that for the most part, we're just showing them how to use a report. It gets fairly repetitive. Uh, and then you will just focus on the, the biology. And then we can also have one-on-one -on -one discussions uh, where if the patient shares the report with you, in fact, I can show you how that works. If I'm John Smith, the patient, I can share my report, uh, enter in you, my doctor's name and email address, and it sends you a link where you get full access to their interactive report. At that point, you can contact me or Dr. Nguyen and we can have a one-on-one -on -one consult without the patient uh, where you would share the report. We wouldn't need a HIPAA waiver at that point because they've already shared the report with the, you. I wouldn't be uh, uh, violating any, any HIPAA regulation by having that discussion. Let me know if any of my answers do not answer your question and I'll, I'll try to refine the answer. And Carol's telling me I, have a, I did a great job. Thank you, Carol. I just got a little squeeze of oxytocin because of that uh, kudos. I want some oxytocin, Carol. <laughs> well, Laura, you know, you, you are, you're a trooper. So I don't, I don't think I covered this, but Laura was employee number one at Genomite. Um, so she was, she saw the importance of, of what this type of approach can do um, before people really knew it was a thing. Still crazy after all these years. <laughs> Right, well, I'd, I'd like to thank you all for coming. And like I said, feel free to reach out to us. Um, basically, this is what I love to do. If you couldn't tell, I love to talk about genetics of mental health. So please uh, feel free to contact me. I have week, bi-weekly sessions, or we can set up a one-on-one. -on -one. And certainly feel free to explore the report on your own and join us next month when we, we do a deep dive and, and dive further on this. Okay, last call for questions, comments. Say goodnight, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. Oh, do you have biologic markers related to the seven parameters and also associated with treatment response? I believe by seven parameters, you're referring to the seven domains, the, the capabilities, uh, the seven different reports, and also associated with treatment response. So by, oh, by, by, by biomarkers, you're, you're referring to markers, like blood markers, not just genetics. So, um, I could have, I, we don't talk about that in the report itself because that would be a clinical, a clinically actionable thing. But on a one-on-one, -on -one, we could discuss, for example, homocysteine for methylfolate, MTHFR. Uh, we could look at other parameters that one could assess. All right, and... There's a combo panel um, question DVD. Yeah, so combo panel, so we don't have anything in the works right now for the combo panel. Right now, what we have is just that discount for MHM. Uh, because of the logistically, one is covered, oftentimes covered by insurance or Medicaid, Medicaid, or Medicaid, Medicare. Offering some type of discount combo gets a little bit uh, ethically challenging because it could be considered inducement. And so we, we, we separate the two and we don't have any combination so far. And we, we may not do so in the future. Um, oh, another big fan of BDNF. Dr. Ballard, me too. It's my favorite gene. That's why I covered it. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. And I, I hope that we have uh, a chance to, to meet one-on-one -on -one in the future. Have a good evening. Thanks, everyone. Good night.